Hi, and welcome to the 40th question hour. So I've received some interesting questions again for uh, uh, this month's uh, question hour. Uh, the first one I would like to start with is a question about reincarnation. The question is, do all types of being reincarnate? Well, to be able to answer that, we have to understand what types of being there are in existence. And roughly, you could say there are two types of being. You have beings which grow towards complexity. Humans are an example of that. So rather than being a simple algae or single-celled organism, we become more and more complex and we're juggling our instincts, our emotions, our thoughts, uh, our culture, our history, and getting into more and more uh, yeah, complexity. And there are beings which move towards a simplicity, towards a stable state. Um, for instance, if you look at what we would call a dead planet, uh, first it is liquid, it is moving, there is uh, um, magma flowing, tectonic plates moving, and slowly but surely things settle, and the chemical reactions cease. And it's very similar actually with the sun. Now the sun is very active, there are explosions, there are magnetic fields, um, there is fusion and fission reactions going on, but ultimately all these things will cease and it will become a very inert mass. So you could say there is on the one hand an evolution towards complexity and instability, and on the other hand there is a path of evolution <coughs> towards a very stable state. Both forms have of course their advantages. The advantage of a very unstable state is it makes you very responsive, very reactive. It makes you more quick. Um, so the lives of beings which are grown towards complexity tend to be very very short also. Because it is all about adaptation to changing circumstances. Well if you look at the life of a planetary body or uh, a sun, they tend to live quite long uh, compared to yeah, other beings and they grow towards more and more stability so they have a very fixed end state and in a way the end state is almost already um, known at the beginning of the process because there is not that much um, change in the process itself not so much random chance or interactions as you would have with beings which are evolving towards complexity. But of these two types of beings, not all of them do have a physical form. So I'm taking here the word reincarnation, not in its very literal form, to become flesh again, because planets are also not flesh, stones are not flesh, uh, but rather to take a physical form or a lower form. Uh, there are two processes going on. You have the, the spiritual evolution process where we go into higher and higher vibrations. You have the involution process where we go into lower and lower vibrations. And the process of going from a higher state into a lower state is an involution process and also the process of reincarnation. My spirit yeah, f going into a body is also a similar process of manifesting itself into a lower dimension, into a lower state of being. So the question might be like why? Because isn't the purpose to go higher and higher into higher states of consciousness? So why would we go into a lower form? Um, there are several reasons to do that. Um, and roughly you can put them in also into two categories. One of the categories is because you want to manifest, and the other one is because you want to grow. And it may seem a little bit counterintuitive if you want to go there, to go there instead. But when we are in lower forms, we have a lot more focus and also a lot more limitations, but things tend to happen and we're also forced to adapt. If you are already in a very high state and you're accepting everything, you're in harmony with everything, there is no adaptation process, there is no learning process. And 
in a way the smaller you make your power uh, and the greater the power of your environment becomes relative to you as happens when you move down in this chain. And the more you start feeling powerless and victimized and having to struggle to survive or to attain your goals, out of this very struggle we start experimenting with different strategies, with different ways of being, with different ways of acting. And out of all these experiments um, we ultimately create change. We get the power to transform ourselves. So by going into lower forms we are in a way forcing growth upon ourselves, which we would not have if we would be of a much higher form. So you can compare it a little bit with you can be a whale and you're really big and nothing in a way challenges you, nothing is dangerous to you. Or you can be a mouse, where almost every other animal is trying to eat you. And by being a mouse, yes, your life might end very quickly and be very brief, but also you will have more experiences, more learning, more challenges than when you are a whale. In the same way, if you are in higher layers of consciousness, you are not as challenged as when you are in lower layers of consciousness. So this is about the process of self-development. The other part is the <coughs> manifestation of power. Because on these higher levels we have the essence of it. You could say you have the principle of love or the principle of war. But love can manifest itself into almost an infinite number of forms and the same with war. And to play around with such a principle, if you feel you have this essence of love or war within you and you want to work with it, you want to manifest it, you want to make it move, uh, it has to go on a lower level to move. Because on the higher levels there is merely existence, but not as much manifestation, there is not so much interaction with other powers. There is also no choice. Do I choose love or do I choose war? How shall I react? Will I react with kindness, forgiving, understanding? Or will I react with feeling hurt, feeling angry, uh, becoming aggressive? So these choices are in a way um, forced upon us by being in these lower levels. But also if we have a certain power, we can also manifest that. We can teach other people about love or about war. And by sharing ourselves into these lower dimensions, we can, in a way, make a little showcase. Like, okay, this is how I think war is, or what war is to me, and this is how I think love is, or what love is to me. And by seeing all these other patterns, all these other choices, we can think about ourselves, like, Okay, do I agree with myself? Do I want to try out some maybe some other pattern and see if that would be an interesting path of development for myself? So we find that almost all beings have this desire to hop a little bit to and fro in a level of consciousness. Um, and often we go up to seek stability, to seek wisdom, to seek guidance, and we go down to try to manifest ourselves, to play around, to experiment. And for instance, if you take a being which doesn't have a physical body, like a, a spirit guide, the spirit guide will occasionally go move down, closer to the human, they're guiding to experience what it is like to, to see, to hear, uh, to smell, um, to have physical emotions, uh, to have memories, and all these sensations are of course very new and uh, different to a spirit, but also the spirit's consciousness becomes overwhelmed by these lower vibrations. So this is the, you could say, the incarnation process where the spirit is trying to understand the human which they are guiding 
and what are they experiencing, what is their view on things. And on the other hand, the spirit will also move upwards, because when the human is faced with a challenge and they don't have the answer, they need to go to higher worlds, contact higher spirits, to try to get the wisdom and the guidance, or to ask assistance for their human, so they can resolve their, their issues and move forward. So even a non-physical being goes through a process of going lower and going higher in their consciousness. And even while we are incarnated, we are also doing the same thing. We can spend times meditating, praying, sleeping, and moving into higher layers of consciousness. And we can spend time focusing um, on our work or on something else. We can be in the grip of uh, emotions, anger, love, desire. Um, we can even be in the grip of physical sensations like feeling pain or feeling bliss. Um, and so our own consciousness, even while we're in one form, has also a certain range where it can move. So we're in a way constantly in a process of like going into deeper into our incarnation and moving more out of our bodies, out of our incarnation. What we typically call incarnation would be life and death going so far out of the body that the body cannot sustain itself and collapses or the other way around that the body has collapsed and because of that it cannot sustain the spirit anymore. And this does not happen to all beings. Uh, for many beings it is more of a free choice. Uh, they can move in and out of their body but if you look at for instance the spirits of the earth, stone spirits, they're not that attached to one specific body. They consider the entire planet to be their body. It's more of a, a shared body, a communal property, you could say. So these stone spirits move in and out of rocks and crystals and some stay there for millions of years in that specific body and others move around every yeah, maybe 10, 20, 100 years and they're much more mobile in trying out different crystalline forms. So they have a process of incarnating and de-incarnating and going into uh, yeah, different physical bodies without the necessity of yeah, the, the, the physical body dying or being destroyed. It is very different for living beings. Most living beings have a spirit because the living being itself and the experiences of the living being are very interesting to spirits. So if you just would create life or a new life form, it is very likely to attract a spirit who will want to feel what that is like, see what it is like to be an incarnated being. Um, but if the life form is in a way uh, having experiences which are not interesting from a spiritual perspective, um, then it is not so likely to attract um, a spirit or a very only a very very simple and lowly type of spirit. So if you look at for instance like chemical evolution, viruses, um, a little virus doesn't really have uh, a spirit in the same way like a duck or a chicken has. Um, and in the same way also if you very much limit the possible experiences as you see in um, uh, industrial farming where the plant is grown uh, just on a synthetic fiberglass medium uh, and has no contact actually with earth or with even the outside air because it's grown in a, in a greenhouse then um, there are no interesting experiences, no interesting lessons to be learned from such an existence. And the same is true for factory farmed meat. Uh, there's not really much opportunity to try out different strategies, to experiment, to play with your environment. So it would only s serve as a frustration for a spirit to be incarnated in such a body. 
So we find that most forms do have some kind of consciousness or spirit attached to them. Uh, but the happiness of that, uh, that spirit and the contentness of it is usually um, very much due to in its expectations. What degree does the, uh, is the form able to use its ability? And if the form is able to use all its ability, like um, a fox living in the wild, it has to be wily, it has to be cunning, it has to find a hole, it has to find food, then such a life is, from a spiritual perspective, experienced as very yeah, valuable. Well, if yeah, there is very little experience, like you're really literally being cared for from cradle to grave, uh, then such a life is less desirable from a spirit perspective. Of course, from the perspective of the ego, which wants to maintain its life, wants to maintain its equilibrium, the opposite is true. It is very nice to have everything in a safe way, not to have stress, not to have pain. Uh, but even though this can be very satisfactory to our instincts or to our, our ego, it is very unsatisfactory to our spirit. And often we find that people who have everything ultimately also succumb to depressions because of the discontentment of their spirit. The spirit is in a way what gives life force, which gives motivation. And sometimes we need problems, we need challenges, we need dramas uh, to keep our spirit interested in our incarnation and to keep it moving forward. So. It's also possible for a spirit to change a little bit because, as I said, like you can work to manifest, to create something, to manifest something so others can learn from it, or you can be more interested in your personal development. And often you see that there's also a little bit of a shift. Often when people are in the beginning of their lives, they're in a way looking, experimenting with different forms, different shapes. And once their power is more maturing, uh, then they're more interested in yeah, sharing what they have developed rather than developing new things. So there's a kind of a slow down of the growth process, a crystallization process. So you could say also in, in consciousness the person is moving away from the playful lower domains, lower dimensions and going more and more into the higher states of consciousness where there's less mobility, less growth. Everything is there much slower. Um, and it's often depending also on the desire of the spirit to grow, whether it will look for relatively short lives which are very mobile uh, and stay active also and innovative until a, a later age, or already quite quickly go into a more sedentary form. So I hope this. It gives a little bit of insight into the process of, uh, of incarnation and also the motivations for incarnation.